Yeah, so I think for today, I will just also talk about the MCMC simulation budgets and then whatever the rest of the time we can work on lab four that, um, that is a group work, which is about hierarchical modeling. So MCMC simulation by JAX. Um, so we already show you um, what the data model is, right? We also show you what kind of weekly informative priors that we can give. So now the task is to make sure that we're able to write out the JAX code and then also making sure that we can estimate it correctly. Okay? So this is a JAX script. Okay? I think given that we have seen, um, this is probably the third JAX script uh, for the model string itself. I think it's probably a good idea to, to have you first uh, read through it, um, thinking through it, and then talk to your neighbors to make sure that you know what each part is and ideally what each line is about and why we use that. And then we can address any questions and I will take the time to talk about the code line by line. And then we can move on to talk about how to um, perform the MCMC estimation itself. Okay, so I'm gonna pause here. For the remote student, this is slide 18 from the uh, slides that I posted. So the task is to discuss ideally line by line of why we write the code in this way. Of course, along the way, if you find any questions that or ways of coding that is confusing to you, note them down so we can address them together later as well. All right, so usually, like I said, the JAX script is very descriptive of the model itself. Okay. So uh, typically when I try to write JAX script, I will write down first what the model is and then do it side by side. Um, so for example, at the sampling stage, right, we have this. We have our y i equals normal uh, beta zero plus beta, uh, beta one x, right? And then sigma, that's the standard deviation. And then we also know that beta zero follows a normal prior. Beta one follows a normal prior. And then one over sigma square follows a gamma prior. So for us, in this case, we should have a model sampling block. And then at the bottom, we have the priors block. Okay. So for the sampling block, this is the part that we have. Okay, so we know that yi independently follows a normal with beta zero plus beta i, uh, beta one times xi, and then with the standard deviation sigma. And because this is looking at n observations in total, and we usually write a loop over here. So we have seen this before. So we have a for loop, and then each of the yi if it follows a normal. So remember, in JAX, when you are trying to write out that the random variable follows a normal distribution over here, uh, you use D-norm, okay? And you plug in the mean, which in our case is beta zero plus beta one times Xi, okay? So Xi later on gonna be passed over, okay? And then don't forget, this is very easy to, um, to make mistake over here, <coughs> is that D-norm in JAX takes uh, precision. So instead of sigma, we're giving the inverse sigma squared. So I've seen this uh, technique in the past. So I think just want to highlight one more time. It's easy to make mistakes. So and it's, it's important to keep that in mind that we're using the precision in D norm. That's just how syntax um, of objects works. Okay, so that completes uh, the modeling or I should say the sampling block. And then the prior, okay, we know that we have beta follows a normal. So beta zero follows the D norm, whatever the value that we're gonna give later. I think we're talking about zero and a hundred, right, earlier. So we're gonna try to um, later on pass those numbers in. Similarly, we're looking at beta one follows a normal. So that's tilde D norm as well. Inverse sigma square, which as we know, one over sigma square follows a gamma. So we're just using D gamma over here. And just like the technique that we have seen before, sometimes maybe instead of inverse gamma square, you want to track sigma itself. Oh, sorry, inverse sigma square, you want to track sigma itself. So we can use the square root of the inverse of inverse gamma two in order to make sure that we can also track sigma directly in the monitor uh, in the monitor syntax when we're dealing with, with JAX. Okay, overall makes sense. Jack script. Yeah, like I said, I think it's very descriptive of the model that you're fitting. And in some way, this is probably simpler than the one that we have done with the hierarchical model. 
Okay, so if you remember for the hierarchical model that we did before, uh, we're gonna have, well, we, we have a loop at the top, but we also have, I think, a loop for the prior part as well, because each of the mu j's, if you remember, follows its own um, normal distribution. And we also have a block for the hyper priors because we have some hyper priors in that model. And so that code is a little bit more complicated, which is in uh, lab four for you to practice. Um, so like I said, after we're done with the, this part, we'll give you the time um, for the rest of the class to, to work on lab four. But overall, I would say the simple linear regression model, the JAX derivative itself is not very complicated. It is following very similar to what we had done before with the normal model. But then of course, right now we're adding um, those parameters, which is uh, which includes the uh, intercept, the slope, as well as the um, standard deviation. So that's the model string, as we know. And then, of course, we have to pass the data and the hyperparameter values to JAX. Um, so the data is coming from, uh, well, we know that the outcome is the log total expenditure, which is stored in X, and then the Y, uh, sorry, in Y. And then the X is the total log income. So we store that in X and it's the number of observations. And then this is the typical way that we're passing the data and the other things in. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that remember uh, for beta zero and beta one, we give both of them normal zero and 100, right? So zero is the mean and 100 is the standard deviation. Okay? But however, don't forget, JAX takes um, precision. So instead of putting G0 and G1 over here to be about 100, um, which is the standard deviation, you should do one over 100 squared because that's the precision. Okay. So making sure that you are specifying the prior that you really want to into the JAX code. And the D norm in JAX is always a little tricky because it's quite different from how the other things are being specified compared to how R is doing things. Um, so just want to highlight once again, this should be the precision, and that is why there are 0.0001 instead of 100, which is the standard deviation that we're giving. And then in this function, if you remember, this is trying to make sure that the code is reproducible, so it's actually a pretty uh, standard um, block that we use everywhere. So with all of that, we're able to uh, round the JAX code for this model using the round JAX function. So once again, it needs the model stream. It needs the number of chains that we're doing. It needs the data to be passed. Uh, it also needs the variables that uh, the parameters that we want to monitor, which means that we're going to track uh, the posterior draw. So we have our beta zero, beta one, and sigma. So later on, the output of the posterior is going to include these three parameters. Uh, we specify the number of depth, the burning period, the sample period, and thing. You can always start with one just to see how it goes, and then you can adjust it accordingly later if model diagnostics do not seem good enough. And then we also add this in it, so we're able to get reproducible results. All right, so let's look at the results first. Okay, So we can always obtain posterior summaries of all variables together by using the summary command on the posterior output object. And overall, um, I will highlight because you will see that soon as well, is that overall things seem fine and all that, but the effective sample size, for beta zero and beta one is very low. Okay. So this is probably indicating that there is high autocorrelation going on in your MCMC, okay. which once you start to plot, um, you will see it pretty clearly. So this is a plot of the beta zero parameter and look at the autocorrelation plot. It is still very highly correlated even after 35 lag. Okay. So this is something that, well, you might want to set your thin as large as 35 or 35 probably is not enough. And of course, this is also manifested in the trace plot. Okay. So this is typically what we call a sticky trace plot. Okay. You don't really freely explore the parameter space and the adjacent draws are still very much um, related to the previous one and all that. Okay. So that's for beta zero. I think beta one is no different, okay? Because we saw effective sample size earlier in the output is pretty uh, pretty low, and that is indicative of what we're seeing over here. Uh, sigma, as we saw earlier, the effective sample size was pretty good, and indeed it is freely exploring the parameter space and everything. Okay. So, but nevertheless, for MCMC diagnostics, we need all of the parameters to pass before we can feel comfortable that the MCMC estimation has been done properly. So, 
because beta zero and beta one do not seem to have done well enough. We will go back to this part. And just to get us started, I set 10 to be 50. Okay? And that number is based on the autocorrelation plot that we have seen earlier. And I will just say that because earlier, let me just come back here. Earlier, uh, the autocorrelation is still pretty high after 35 lags. So setting 10 to be 50 might not be enough. Okay, So you might need to go back and forth, try and error. Um, but just to get us started, I set this to be 50. Everything else stays the same. And um, so first of all, when we look at the output, seems to be a little bit better. Okay, still high, but definitely um, this effective sample size is, um, is getting better for beta zero and beta one. And overall, if we look at the uh, trace plots up here, and then also the autocorrelation plot, it's still a little bit high. Okay, you might even want to do it. So by the way, when you look at this one, if thin equals to 50, and you see here, maybe like, like one, two, or maybe three um, is finally dying down, then this probably suggesting you to do thing of 50 times three, okay, which is gonna be 150, okay, because now we're doing the multiple effect. Um, but nevertheless, um, seems that 50 is much better um, than before. So this is beta one, and then sigma was no issue before. And then if you do further thinning, it shouldn't be an issue like this. So this is probably the example, the first, Example that we have seen that well, our correlation as well as the trace plots are showing us problematic uh, mixing and uh, or convergence. So we should be um, adjusting things accordingly. Okay. So lastly, I want to say that well, uh, from our from our model output, okay, uh, we see that the mean of beta zero is about 0.3. Okay, the mean for beta one is about 0.42. And then the sigma is about 0.72. Um, so as you know, the interpretation is mostly taking place of the intercept and the slope. Okay, so we should make sure that we know what they really mean after we have done all of this estimation. So those numbers will come into play in our interpretation. Um, so the mean or, or the median, I should say. Yeah, I guess I would use the median, but either one should be fine if they're relatively symmetric. Uh, the intercept beta zero uh, with medium about 4.3-ish. What that means is that for a consumer unit with log income zero, uh, the expected log expenditure is going to be about $4.3. Um, and the 90% posterior, uh, or I should say credible interval, gives us a 3.9-ish to 4.7-ish, uh, which will give you the 90% posterior probability. So that's for the intercept. The slope is going to be for every $1 increase in the log income of a CU. It's log expenditure going to increase by the median, which is 0 .4, 0 0.421. And of course, we can also get the 90% credible interval, uh, which shows us um, how likely this value is between these two values with 90% posterior probability. OK, overall makes sense. Okay. And you might be wondering, OK, why the values are so small and all that. Don't forget, we have taken the log of the outcome as well as the um, um, predictive variables. And that's why the numbers are pretty small uh, in a sense that we're working on the log scale for both the predictor and the outcome. Um, so keep that in mind because sometimes your interpretation might, you might want to go back to the original scale and then you have to do things accordingly that way. All right, so I think that's what I have prepared for today. Uh, next week, we're gonna continue the rest of the lecture so we can have uh, some time today as well for you to work on lab four. So like I said, lab four is about hierarchical modeling and it's a good practice to you, uh, for you to make sure that you can do things with jacks in a particular context and a particular way, different priors that you can use. Um, it's kind of due next week, so I wanted to give you more time in class as well as um, when you have time outside of class to, to work on the problems, and I can also just answer questions as you go along. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, stop here.